Greetings. I'm Brian Hurley, the Medical Director of the Division of Substance Abuse Prevention and Control in the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. And I'm here to talk about managing substance use disorders in primary care. Now, I don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose. I'm not going to try to sell you anything today. I am the president-elect of the American Society of Addiction Medicine, so it's possible that some of my comments might be interpreted as favoring ASAM, but uh, ASAM is not sponsoring any particular medications or other treatments, and I'm uh, not here to try to sell you anything. I invite you, as we talk about treating substance use disorders in primary care, to work with me to try to end the stigma of addiction. In the United States, but I, I think this is also true really across the globe, addiction is primarily conceptualized as a social problem. Uh, we oftentimes punish people with substance use disorders rather than treat people with substance use disorders. So I'd invite you to, to help end the stigma of addiction with me. That is, addiction is a medical disease that we can identify and treat in medical settings um, without necessarily consistently or always using the arm of the law as punishment. Don't make the case that addiction is a chronic disease. I'll point to the genetic heritability. That is, uh, genetics account for between half and three-fourths of the risk of addiction, and we can see this pretty consistently across twin studies. Genetic factors actually appear to be stronger drivers for the initiation of addiction than environmental factors. And the genetic heritability of addiction is comparable to the genetic heritability of high blood pressure, diabetes, and onset asthma. That's comparable to what we see for tobacco, alcohol, cannabis, and heroin use disorder. So we're here at the Mental Health Conference, and you know we're talking about a number of different brain diseases. Addiction is another brain disease, and most brain diseases have some form of behavioral expression. In Alzheimer's disorder, for example, it's memory loss. In schizophrenia, it would involve unusual perceptions of reality and mood. But regardless, addiction and other brain diseases are precipitated by fundamental long-term changes to the biological structures and functioning of the brain organ. If you look at changes in brain metabolism, and this is uh, PET scans looking at tissue health, we see that in the brain of somebody with a cocaine use disorder, there are changes in uh, glucose metabolism, in, in, in tissue health. And that's comparable to the changes that we would see in heart tissue health in the context of heart disease. But one point I'll make here is, even if there are changes in brain function associated with addiction, recovery is possible. That is, just because the tissue may not be functioning well now doesn't mean it can't be restored to full function. And uh, these brain changes are the same whether we're talking about cocaine, methamphetamine, alcohol, heroin. Uh, these last set of um, head scans look at dopamine. And dopamine is one of the two major transmitters. Well, uh, most neurotransmitters are involved with addiction. But dopamine is core to one of the core brain circuits involved with addiction, the brain circuit of dopamine release at the nucleus accumbens. Dopamine release of the nucleus accumbens helps drive positive reinforcement. It drives us to seek out and do more. The amygdala is associated generally with avoidance, right? Negative reinforcement. It drives anxiety, fear, distress, and our sympathetic nervous system. And these two brain circuits drive addictive behavior. That is, um, we seek out, people with substance use disorders seek out drugs as a way of helping keeping their dopamine up because substance use disorders um, cause artificial large spikes in, and then when the intoxication wears off, um, droughts of dopamine. And uh, the fear of withdrawal or the fear of not having drugs, the negative reinforcement that's immediately by the amygdala also drives disordered behavior. This is a schematic uh, that I should thank my colleague, the Health Management Associates, for, for creating, that look at dopamine response to heroin. And we see the first time people use heroin, they have a huge dopamine response. Over time, that dopamine response diminishes. That's called tolerance. But notably, the basal level of dopamine, that is the dopamine that we need to get up and go about our day, uh, is lower in between use episodes. And you hear this all the time. People with substance use disorders say, I'm not really using to get high. I'm using because if I don't use, I get sick, I don't feel well, I've, I have difficulty functioning. Now, I mentioned vulnerability to substance use disorders earlier, and I'll highlight there's a number of genetic factors 
um, mostly in our brain, so opioid receptors, dopamine, other transmitters. But um, there's genetic heritability for certain personality characteristics, like novelty seeking, harm avoidance, and impulsivity. Um, psychiatric disorders are also heritable and are drivers of substance use disorder. And then there's environmental factors who raised us, so our parents, siblings, and, and friends. In the United States, there's been a big public health focus on adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs for short. And ACEs, which are usually uh, factors associated with insecurity or not having a safe childhood, um, are big drivers of addiction. Uh, psychiatric disorders, stressors, lack of positive experiences are also uh, environmental factors. And then the availability of drugs is a big environmental driver. The more available and accepted drug use is, the more common we see substance use disorder. Now, relapse is common with addiction. That is, if people stop using, uh, it's not uncommon for people to go back to use for uh, short or even longer periods of time. But I'll highlight that that's not that different in addiction compared to type 2 diabetes, where we see people with elevated blood sugars or hypertension, where we see people in treatment for hypertension, but they continue to have elevated blood pressures. Or asthma, where people are on treatment for their asthma, but they continue to have episodes of dyspnea associated with asthma exacerbation. So the conceptualization of addiction as a chronic disease actually matches most of the definitions of what we think of as chronic diseases. And recovery is possible, right? If you look at a healthy control, people with substance use disorders with appropriate treatment are able to restore normal healthy function. So I invite you to offer forgiveness and understanding. That is, you know, we will still treat patients with diabetes, even if they're not dieting and exercising. And even though diet and exercise are involved with hypertension, congestive heart failure, you know, we still treat these conditions in primary care and have compassion for people with these disorders. I would invite us to offer the same understanding for patients with substance use disorders. But, and this data comes from the United States, anywhere between 10 to 20% of people with substance use disorders actually get treatment. As most people, you know, 80 to 90% of people with substance use disorders don't get treatment. And this treatment gap is pretty consistent across the globe. And the biggest driver of why people don't seek treatment is because they don't want it. And uh, 95%, and again, this comes from the United States, but 95% of people with substance use disorders um, don't get treatment because they don't want it. Now, the model for addiction treatment in, in my community, but I think this is true in communities um, in the UAE, is people go to a specialized center, right? If somebody has a substance use disorder, you send them to a treatment program. But most people with addiction don't want to go to a treatment program. So I would argue, rather than, I mean, one can put together a big public education campaign, an anti-stigma campaign, but rather than trying to get patients into treatment, I actually argue that we'd be more successful getting treatment to where patients are. That is, identifying patients with substance use disorder and starting appropriate treatment in the context of primary care. But to do that, we have to address stigma. So what is stigma? Well, stigma is a mark of shame, an identifying characteristic that indicates the presence of disease. Um, and we are bound to pro uh, provide evidence-based practices. That is to say, for both mental health, as we're here at a mental health conference and substance use disorders, offering patients evidence-based practices whenever they exist. But one of the things that I find is the same stigma that our patients have, you know, uh, shame around addiction and conceptualizing addiction as uh, a social problem rather than as a, as, a, as a medical one, exists in the medical community. That is, I, I have primary care colleagues, uh, uh, nurses, um, medical assistants, primary care physicians that hold very many of the same stigmatized beliefs around addiction that complicate the effect of delivery of addiction treatment. So I would invite us to um, use our language carefully. That is, you know, language can bind us together or tear us apart, but to avoid words like addict, clean, drug abuse, relapse, or dirty, to talk about a recurrence of substance use, uh, getting substance use disorders into remission, our community has a serious drug problem, as opposed to drug abuse problem, because the way we use words helps perpetuate stigma. So my recommendations are avoid labeling our patients, to receive training, actually, you know, bona fide anti-stigma training to help us become aware of our biases and increase our knowledge and understanding. To use person-first language, you know, person with addiction as opposed to an addict. 
a person with a substance use disorder as opposed to a substance abuser. Uh, to create an atmosphere that is supportive with no tolerance or discrimination, and to acknowledge our patients and significant others' uh, experiences and help support people's participation in treatment. Many of us work with supervisors, and I would encourage us to seek clinical supervision if there are um, countertransference, right, feelings or reactions we're having towards patients uh, that might interfere with our ability to, of delivering addiction uh, supportive treatment for, for, uh, for our patients. There's a whole number of screening tools that have been developed. Again, um, the, the tools I'm mostly familiar with are based in the United States, but I would highlight there's the uh, Tobacco Alcohol Prescription and Other Substance Use Screen, or the TAPS screen, that is uh, feasible to do in primary care because it's a screener of uh, past year substance use. And then, depending on what somebody selects, you ask about past three month use and about whether somebody tried and failed to control or cut down their, their use of the involved substance and if anyone expressed concern about the use of the substance. So depending on any substance that someone uses, the TAPS, school, the TAPS tool has an algorithm uh, that helps make the, the assessment or the screening, not the assessment, but the screening as abbreviated as possible. Really what we're looking for is who meets DSM-5 criteria for substance use disorder. So this are the, these are the 11 DSM-5 criteria. There's 11 of them, and they can be lumped into three domains. There's the control domain, that is people losing control over substance use, characterized by substance being taken in larger amounts than intended, or unsuccessful efforts to cut down, a great deal of time spent using and giving up activities related to use. Craving, and I sort of lump craving, tolerance, and withdrawal all into one, like physiologic uh, criteria, and although uh, that you can dispute that, but I think it's a, it's a, reasonable, it's, it's a reasonable domain. So people that are becoming tolerant to substance use, going to withdrawal when they don't use substances, and craving the use of a substance. And then consequences, right? Whether those are medical or psychological consequences, um, recurrent social or interpersonal consequences, failure to fulfill role obligations, like not showing up to work or not being present in one's role in the family, and use the situations in which it's specifically hazardous. So remembering 11 criteria may not always be top of mind for people that, that I work with in primary care, but the three Cs, right? Loss of control of substance use, consequences related to substance use, and then craving tolerance and withdrawal related to substance use is relatively straightforward to remember. Because what we're looking for in screening is who are the majority of patients that do not need any particular intervention, right? Low risk of, of, of use or people that don't use at all. There are people who use substances in ways that are risky, right? People who drink alcohol heavily but who uh, may not have an alcohol use disorder or people who... Um, use drugs recreationally but haven't developed sort of chronic use behaviors. People with uh, uh, risky substance use actually can respond to relatively brief intervention, right? Uh, whether those are evoking from patients their ideas around substance use and then providing psychoeducation, informing them of the risks and advising them to avoid risky substance use. And it's really a relatively narrow proportion of patients that actually meet full DSM criteria for use disorders which usually involves more chronic or ongoing treatment. So what are the components of addiction treatment? Well, we've got medication, we've got counseling, and we've got support. Now, there are patients that need higher levels of care. And to make the analogy here, there are patients with congestive heart failure who get overloaded and need to go to the hospital for monitoring and diuresis, right? So I'm not saying that primary care is the only setting where patients with addiction need to go. Some patients might need to go for withdrawal management or to residential addiction treatment. But kind of like when you send a patient with congestive heart failure to the hospital and the patient gets discharged, the patient comes back to primary care. The similar should be true with addiction, right? That is, people with addiction might need higher levels of care at times, but that uh, primary care can be their medical home, can be their place for ongoing treatment. And we can deliver, within the context of our resources, medications, counseling, and support in the context of primary care. Support is, uh, well, everything you think it would be. Uh, you know, people's employment, their connection to the community, their involvement with religion, their, their, their support of their families, right? Who, in other words, I, I sort of nailed down support to where the people and where are the places and what are the things people are doing in their day-to-day -day life. Counseling, I think of as what are the tools somebody has to help manage their internal triggers for relapse, right? The acronym 
that, that I, uh, I use all the time is halt. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired, right? Um, uh, what are the skills somebody has to avoid getting too hungry, to manage when they feel angry, to help from feeling lonely, and, and, and to help keep from getting too tired? Psychotherapies can be a big part of this. So uh, we have 12-step facilitation therapy. 12-step is 12-step communities are um, in the support category, but 12-step facilitation therapy, um, helping somebody go through the 12 steps, doing an inventory, and uh, and helping support working through that inventory, um, does actually have an evidence basis as a psychotherapy. There's a variety of cognitive and behavioral psychotherapies that have been well studied. There's motivational enhancement therapy or motivational interviewing. And then there's evidence for community reinforcement, contingency management, multi-systemic therapy, multi-dimensional family therapy. Each of these deserves their own talk, and I'm not going to spend a ton more time on them other than to highlight um, that there are a number of evidence-based psychotherapies that can help people with substance use disorders achieve remission. But I'm going to spend most of the rest of my time talking about the Medications for Addiction Treatment, or MAT, uh, for short. Uh, there are a number of medications for addiction treatment. Each can be feasibly prescribed in primary care. And I will admit, I don't know all of the rules regarding which medications are available for prescription in UAE, but I can tell you what the rules are here in the U.S. Um, and these are the medications, right? So methadone in the U.S. is a, a restricted treatment. Even though it can be effectively managed in primary care, like they do in the United Kingdom and in Australia, um, in the U.S., we restrict our methadone to methadone clinics, that is, uh, specialized facilities. As you can imagine, access to methadone is somewhat less than to other medications for opioid addiction because of that regulatory restriction. Buprenorphine can be prescribed in the context of primary care. And I remember reading, at least in 2017, there was a restriction on the duration of buprenorphine that could be prescribed in the context of primary care. I don't know if that's still true, but injectable buprenorphine has hit the market in the U.S. Uh, two years ago. Um, assuming that's also true in UAE, it then offers an additional avenue of getting patients treated with buprenorphine, patients who don't have to take it from the language because they can get buprenorphine injection. Then there's naltrexone. Naltrexone, um, I'll go through the pharmacology of this, um, is a non-opioid and there's no particular uh, registration requirements and medication that can be prescribed. Um, as usual in the context of primary care. But the caveat of naltrexone, there's an evidence base of using naltrexone for the treatment of opioid use disorder, but it's uh, less easy to start in the context of primary care. And then naloxone access, right? A uh, Naloxone is a, a rescuer. It's a rescue medicine. It, it's an antidote to opioid poisoning that, uh, at least in the United States, we've been giving out um, assertively to patients with opioid addiction as, as a way of helping, helping create a tool that can uh, rescue somebody if they're found down in the context of an opioid overdose. Then there's three FDA-approved medications for alcohol use disorder, which is disulfiram, naltrexone, and acamprosate. And then the medications for tobacco, there's a number of nicotine replacement therapy formulations, and bupropion and veronicline also have an evidence base. And that's it. There aren't any other U.S. FDA-approved medications for substance use disorders, although there are some off-label medications that have some efficacy. So I want to go through the pharmacokinetics of buprenorphine, methadone, and naltrexone. So methadone is an opioid. It's what's called a full agonist opioid. The more you take, the more effect there is. And if, you, if somebody takes too much methadone, uh, they would overdose, right? It's relatively straightforward. Methadone has been validated to treat opioid use disorder across the globe. And again, in the United Kingdom, uh, it is perfectly legal to prescribe methadone out of a pharmacy for the indication of opioid use disorder, although patients do have some restriction on how often they need to go to the pharmacy and the duration of take-homes the patient, patient can receive. Uh, buprenorphine is unique because it has some opioid activity like methadone. It's what's called a partial agonist, so it has a partial opioid effect, but not a full opioid effect. And on its own, it's very difficult to overdose on buprenorphine. Buprenorphine is almost never associated with um, respiratory arrest. It has what's called a feeling effect. So, and that feeling effect kicks in somewhere around 32 milligrams in a given day. So even if somebody took 64 milligrams or 128 milligrams or 256 milligrams, took, you know, just large, large quantities of buprenorphine, their brain wouldn't experience more than 32 milligrams because of the feeling effect. So unlike methadone, which feasible to overdose on it. It's very difficult to overdose on buprenorphine. This safety 
of bup- the relative safety of buprenorphine is one of the things that it's driven buprenorphine prescribing in primary care because you worry less about what a patient might do with any extra buprenorphine that they have. And the other uh, characteristic of buprenorphine is even though it's only a partial agonist, it is a super high affinity medication. That is, if somebody takes buprenorphine and they use heroin or a prescription opioid on top, buprenorphine blocks that other opioid from activating the opioid receptor. So it has a partial effect, but almost a blocking effect from other opioids when it's taken. Now, now trexone is different than either methadone or buprenorphine because it's not an opioid. Or, I mean, it binds the opioid receptor, but as a blocker, it just blocks it. So um, starting a patient on methadone is pretty easy. You start giving them doses of methadone and then titrate their methadone dose up until they stop using whatever other opioid they're using. For buprenorphine, it's a little bit trickier because the patient has to already have stopped um, for usually a few hours before they can take their first dose of buprenorphine. Usually dose buprenorphine when somebody's initiating an opioid withdrawal. But for naltrexone, you have to give people usually at least a week off of all opioids before they can get the naltrexone injection. And that's what makes it harder to use is that, that window period between when somebody stops opioid use and when they can start naltrexone. Now, what's the benefits of medication? Well, they're substantial, right? Opioid overdose is the leading cause of death in the United States for people under the age of 50. Um, it's a huge driver of uh, mortality across the globe. And untreated opioid use disorder has six times the cause of all-cause mortality compared to the gender population. Medications alone drive down that risk by over fourfold. That is, Simply offering people access to medications for opioid use disorder has a huge effect on decreasing opioid-related mortality. The other thing, and this is true, there's a whole literature on this in the UAE, which is that people who take buprenorphine or other medications for opioid use disorder are much more likely to remain in treatment and remain off of opioids compared to people that don't. Um, So I've been promoting something called the medication first model, that is, People with opioid use disorder should be offered medications as quickly as possible, even prior to their, say, going to a withdrawal management program or being admitted to addiction treatment. That is, if opioid use disorder offer medications as first line. The World Health Organization actually has a guideline on this. They call it um, the Guide to uh, Psychosocially Assisted Pharmacotherapy for Opioid Use Disorder, emphasizing the primary role of medications in treating opioid use disorder. And then we offer to offer maintenance pharmacotherapy without any arbitrary tapering or time limits. So it's not like you stay on the medication for one month or three months or six months or 12 months, that we, we offer medications as long as the patient is benefiting. And that might mean lifelong for some patients. And then we always, always offer counseling support, right? Counseling support and other psychosocial services are always offered, but that um, medications are contingent upon the patient receiving these services. So, what I sometimes see happen is the patient is supposed to enroll in counseling and then they can get meds. And the correct order is people should get meds and then be offered counseling, but can stay on the meds even if they decline to participate in counseling. They only stop the medication treatment if it's making the patient worse. Medication first, to be clear, I'm not saying med only. It just means that the, the medication is the foundation and we layer on the counseling and support on top of the medication services. Here's a quick handout for how we start buprenorphine in the system where I work, which is stop taking opioids. When you feel withdrawal, put a tablet or strip under the tongue. That's the standard way we start sublingual buprenorphine, which is the dominant form of buprenorphine for treating substance use disorders. And we recommend that people stay on medications for as long as as they're benefiting. And, And there's actually, you know, some good evidence that people who take uh, buprenorphine for their opioid use disorder, go to the emergency room less, go to the hospital less, have, have dramatic, uh, it, it, it has dramatic effects on people's health and well-being. The FDA-approved buprenorphine formulations include uh, brand name tablets and films. Um, uh, we co-formulate buprenorphine with naloxone in the United States to help um, prevent patients from uh, injecting or snorting it because the naloxone will block the buprenorphine effect briefly if um, buprenorphine with naloxone is injected or snorted. Incidentally, buprenorphine with naloxone when taken under the tongue, the naloxone isn't absorbed. So uh, that's a way of delivering buprenorphine with this uh, formulation with naloxone that helps prevent against parenteral use. Um, But there is a buprenorphine-only product. Uh, it's It's a tablet. 
And then there's uh, a monthly injectable form of buprenorphine. There used to be actually a buprenorphine implant, but it was taken off the market. I don't know if that's true in the UAE, but it was true in the United States. Um, these are the medications for alcohol use disorder. They include naltrexone, a camprosate, and disulfiram. Naltrexone, which is the same naltrexone that's used for opioid use disorder, I'll point out naltrexone for opioid use disorder should really be given in the injectable format. The oral form of naltrexone doesn't appear to be that effective. Oral naltrexone or injectable naltrexone for alcohol use disorder actually is quite effective. It helps reduce um, the euphoria people get when they drink, and it also um, helps reduce the number of heavy drinking episodes and days. Um, so it's not a drug that makes you stop drinking, but it's a medication that helps reduce the amount of heavy drinking. A camper state seems to have its strongest effect when people have already stopped drinking to help them stay stopped for longer. And disulfiram in primary care, interestingly, doesn't seem to separate from placebo. That is, disulfiram is not a terribly effective medication when prescribed just in the context of routine ambulatory care. It only works if you take it because if you, it's a medication that if you, you take it and then you drink on top of it, it can cause um, severe medical illness. And so most patients know this and they stop taking the disulfiram when they're ready to drink. If you have a patient that you're observed taking the dose, disulfiram can be effective in observed dosing trials. But on its own, it tends not to have much of an effect. Whereas now Trexone and Acamprosate, you can drink on top of them. They don't make you sick if you drink on top of them. And they're medications that help reduce alcohol use. This is oral naltrexone looks like, um, and this is a handout that we give our patients to take oral naltrexone, which is um, naltrexone can cause liver inflammation, so let us know if you have liver problems. Um, don't take naltrexone if you're taking any opioids because you have to be off of opioids before you can receive any doses of naltrexone, and it's uh, one pill a day. Um, or a once-a-month injection. Uh, there's a version of naltrexone, again, a, a once-a-month injection. And what does naltrexone do? Well, this is um, a relatively clear illustration. The um, faintly dotted line is people that received an injection of placebo when we looked at their drinking behavior. People that received the full dose of naltrexone, the 380 milligrams of naltrexone, um, that's the dark undotted line, had fewer heavy drinking days. So it's not a medication that makes you stop drinking. It just helps you drink less. And here's a chart of the seven different formulations of medications approved for tobacco use disorder. So there's uh, five formulations of nicotine replacement therapy plus bupropion and varenicline. And combination therapy um, uh, tends to work best. So the patch plus the gum or lozenge or you know, bupropion plus the gum or lozenge tends to work better than either the patch or uh, the gum or the lozenge or any individual agent alone. So the... Um, uh, so we're recommending, or I, I'm recommending combination treatments for tobacco use disorder, people that smoke cigarettes or use hookah or chew uh, with, with other tobacco use disorders. We don't have any medications FDA approved for methamphetamine use disorder. There is some evidence for bupropion, topiramate, naltrexone, and mirtazapine for the treatment of methamphetamine use disorder. But um, again, uh, the, the evidence is relatively nascent. And here are my references. If uh, this is my email address, if there's any questions that come up and that I'm not able to address during the question and answer session following this session, I am affiliated with UCLA, even though I work in LA County. And I'd invite any of you to attend the American Society of Addiction Medicine meeting. This is where my conflict of interest might emerge. Uh, or our California Society of Addiction Medicine meeting or the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry meeting. Um, we've got uh, uh, meetings coming up. So uh, thank you so much for your time and attention. And I look forward to taking your questions.